John chapter 2. Appreciate y'all coming, being here. Appreciate everybody visiting with us online. And, and uh, just appreciate all the prayers and phone calls and encouragement and emails and questions people send and things like that. Had a conversation with a guy that we didn't really see eye to eye, but we didn't fight over it. That's good. I was glad for that. I just don't like debating people. I don't like fighting over what I believe versus what they believe. I mean, I believe you can have friendly conversations among brethren and and uh, but I've I've seen I've seen church fights, preachers fights. I've seen preachers versus deacons. I've seen deacon's wives slap other deacons in the face here during business meetings. I've seen all of that stuff. Church split. Been through all of that. It doesn't do any good. It's not productive. Doesn't, doesn't help anybody. And uh, just seen a lot of things in my years being in church. And um, I just... I don't know, sometimes we just don't see eye to eye on things. There ain't no reason fighting over it. Somebody's got to be wrong, and then what difference does it make who it is? Let God be true and every man a liar. Yes, sir. Oh, really? Check to see if you got one? Yeah. All right. How long you got to wear it? I mean, is it just in the office for a while or do you go home with it? Oh, okay. Yeah, because he's got blood pressure things goes on with him. And so they're checking him out. They moved Sister Linda to me up to Barnes Hospital today. And the hope is that maybe they'll find or the doctors up there would be uh, be able to do something different for her that might help her. But to be honest with you, she is, she is really struggling. She has her heart, her lungs, her liver, and her kidneys are failing. And she sleeps most of the time. And when, she's wake, when she wakes up, sometimes she's not all that lucid. Um... And it, it may just be a matter of time with her. We know where she's going. She knows where she's going. Her family knows where she's going. And, um, I mean, I love her family. And I want, I want, I know what she wants. She wants her daughter and her sons to be in heaven, to be with her, is what she wants. And um, you just pray for her, pray for uh, Janice. Kenny is their brother, Danny is their little brother. And uh, just pray for all three of them and just, just pray for that family. Yes? I don't want to make a big statement. They do have to take my ambulance for the scars he's having, um, chest pain, dizziness, and blurred vision. Wow. Um, a couple hours ago, she said that we did some prayer. Where'd they take him? Wow. Okay. Yeah, he's got some heart issues. And um, he came in my, we visited Sunday afternoon between services, and he told me some things that he had got involved in before he really just yielded everything over to the Lord. And I'm talking about occult things. And uh, he said he has seen and experienced some spooky stuff. And if you ask him if devils are real and that they manifest themselves, he'll say absolutely 100% yes. And uh, I recorded, he let me record the conversation and some of the stories that he told. I'll try to get those down. I put up a website a couple years ago called Cryptid Bible, and I haven't really used it much. Uh, but I want to because I think 
and, and I, still, I still stand on this, I think people are going to see more in the way of supernatural happenings, spiritual events, not a good spirit either, but supernatural happenings. I think they're going to increase as the days go by and as wickedness increases, you're going to have an increase in satanic activity, spiritual activity. And it's going to mess with people's minds who don't really believe in such things. I um, want one of the blessings of going to the Bible college that I did. There was a couple of good things that came out of it. And one of them was I was good friends with a missionary's son. His mom and dad were missionaries to Brazil. They had to learn Portuguese and all. He spoke Portuguese very well, grew up there. But any third world country, you see manifestations of devils. You see them manifested. You'll have, you'll have people who are possessed of devils come to your church just to disrupt the service. He said they had that several times. They cast out devils out of people. They had services where they did that. We don't see that in America. Doesn't mean the devils aren't here. They hide better here. Okay, but I think the manifestations are coming. So pray for David and pray for, and lift him up and just pray for his health. All right. Uh, John chapter 2, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Then we'll pray at the end of the service. Father, we ask your blessings uh, upon this service. We thank you, God, for some beautiful weather. We know, Father, it probably won't last very long. This is still February. And uh, we're still in winter time, but... Uh, God, we know that uh, you'll make that grass start growing here before too long. We thank you, Lord, for winter time, springtime, summertime, fall time, and Bible time. We thank you for all of these. We pray, dear God, that you'd bless the teaching of your word tonight. Open up our hearts, our ears, help us to be attentive. And Lord, show us, some, show us your ways. Show us how you do things and what to expect and when to expect them. Father, make them known to us and manifest to us, Father, who just believe your word. Bless all those who have attended here tonight. Bless those who have attended online. I pray, God, that you would open up their eyes and ears to your word now. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. John chapter 2, uh, last Wednesday night, I recorded a message and uh, finally got it online. Uh, when Jesus, and I'll, I'll just read over this very quickly in, in case you didn't uh, get to see that. It wasn't broadcast live, but I, it was recorded. In John chapter 2, verse 13, the Jews' Passover was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. Count that verse. Count things in that verse. How many things are they doing in the temple in that verse? Let's see here. They sold oxen, sheep, doves, changed money. See that? Four. Imagine that. So what are they doing, John? They're selling a false gospel. And the thing is, God, this goes all the way back to the law. The Jews were fulfilling the law. They were required to bring to the temple offerings, sacrifices, and so on. Redemption of sins. Christ has not died yet. So the Old Testament law was still in force. But some of these people traveled a very long journey. It was not feasible for them to bring an ox, a lamb, a goat, or whatever it was. Uh, to be sacrificed. So they figured when we get to Jerusalem, we'll buy what we need. And, or if we owe tithes or anything like that, we will pay that. And so there were some Jewish businessmen. Think about that. Still Jewish businessmen who set up table at the temple. Number one, they had collected and bought 
the, the prize sheep and goats and lambs and oxen and whatever it was to be sacrificed. And the money changers, here they come in from some place in the Roman Empire. Israel was under the Roman Empire at that time. They brought in Roman coins, Roman money to give. And those Jews would say, well, we're not going to take money with Caesar's face on it. That dishonors God. We need to convert that to shekels, which they would. But they would charge them an exorbitant amount of money to exchange the money. They were making money off of people fulfilling the law. Evil, wicked people. That was their own brethren. And then they had these, you know, these spotless lambs, spotless goats, because that was the requirement. People would come and say, well, I'll give you 500 shekels for that one. Are you kidding me? I've got lambs I threw away last week for 500 shekels. That's a 1,500 shekel lamb if I ever saw one. And just jacked up and they, they had to pay it because they had to fulfill the law. And Jesus was furious about this. Whose house was it? It's his. Yeah, right. There's not a law. Matthew says you can't destroy your own property. Okay, there is. Thank God for that. So I've done enough of it in my time. Uh, there's no law against it. So Jesus goes in and he sees what they're doing, taking advantage of them. They have, they've turned the house of God into a den of robbers. A den of thieves. Jeremiah said the same thing. They've turned my house into a house of robbers, a den of thieves. And so he, that's when he made a scourge. He's beating those guys with that scourge. Over, tips over the money tables. Well, if you're poor, what are you going to do? Take the money and run. Jesus did not, have, apparently did not have a problem with that at all. But he's furious and he said, it is written, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a house of, uh, uh, verse 16, he said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And uh, I'm thankful to say that God has led us here at this church to not do that with the things that God, God reminded me years ago, Mike, how much did I charge you to give you what you know? Not a dime. In fact, I didn't deserve it. God said, that's right, give it away. And God's blessed that ever since. Uh, so he said unto them, in verse 18 now, the Jews now are figuring out, this is the beginning of the gospel of John, the beginning of the ministry of Christ. The Jews are figuring out who this guy is and they figured out they don't like him. He's upset their little marketplace that they had going here, selling salvation, selling the gospel. And so... They answered, then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us seeing that, that, that thou doest these things? In other, words, in other words, who do you think you are? Who, what gives you the right to come into this place and do this? They didn't understand it. It was his house. But they wanted a sign. And when the sign didn't show up, then they were going to have something to accuse him with. That's what they were doing. They were setting him up. Jesus answered in verse 19, said unto them, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Now they're just going, oh, this is going to be easy. Nobody can do that. But notice what they said. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years. I, when I read that, John, I went, naturally, was this temple in building? And wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Now, uh, very quickly, go over to Second uh, Peter. Second Peter chapter 2. You define the Bible by the Bible. Let scripture interpret scripture. You compare spiritual things with spiritual things. What type of days was Jesus talking about? 
Was he speaking of three literal days or as we see in, uh, it's actually second Peter three, as we see in second Peter three, was he speaking of a day along the lines of another time reference in second Peter chapter three, verse eight, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And that's one witness. We have another witness in Psalm that says um, for yesterday is as a thousand years in thy sight, O Lord. So we have two witnesses, one Old Testament, one New Testament that indicate to us that when God speaks of a day, it can be a literal 24 hour round the clock day or and or it can be 1000 years. That's how God is defining it. This is why if you're going to define something in the Bible, you use the Bible and only the Bible. You don't step outside of the Bible and read some scholar or some commentary or whatever. I took a whole class and actually I, I enjoyed the class. It was on the book of Romans and it was a, a one semester class and there were no tests, whippee, but there was term papers and I could write good term papers. But in, in writing the term papers, we had to use a minimum of at least four different commentaries from the school library. School had a big library and they had a bunch of commentaries. So we had to use commentaries to aid us in writing our little term papers. And the, the final exam was a, was a term paper that you wrote in the class. You had, he gave you the passage ahead of time and studied it out. But we had to quote these commentaries. I can't tell you when the last time I ever consulted a commentary been a long time I won't say how long but it's been a long time because I don't need it if I want to know something I'm either going to consult scripture that I already know or I'm going to ask God to show me the right scriptures to connect to this to give me the definition so let's go back now and look at this and, and answer this question destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building, with thou reared up in three days. But he spake of the temple of his body. So now we have a possibility. We have a possibility that it could be a literal three days, or it could be in the vicinity of 3,000 years. Okay? Which is it? Or could it not be both of them? Verse 21, he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. Remember, Bible prophecy is always best understood after it happens. For us. For us. Because then we look back and go, Oh, that's what he meant. I get it now. And it's like that all the way. When Jesus, after he had, had uh, resurrected, remember he was on the road to Emmaus with these two guys and he was talking. And he was going all through the Old Testament talking about how Jesus the Savior was in all through the Old Testament. And these guys were just eating this up. But what he had done was he had fulfilled significant portions of the Old Testament. And as he's telling that to these men, they're just, they want more. They invite him to supper. You got to let our daddy hear this. And Jesus starts doing the same thing. He's telling about all the Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled with Christ's life, his birth, his death, his resurrection, and so on. And then all of a sudden, as they're eating the dessert, all of a sudden he's gone. Forks pausing in midair. Where did he go? But it was, un they understood now the prophecies that were given because they happened and they happened exactly the way God said they were going to happen to the letter, the way God said they were going to happen. 
So that's what I believe about Bible prophecy. I don't believe that it's simply metaphorical without a literal interpretation. I do believe that there are symbols and metaphors all through the Bible, but I believe they also have a literal interpretation to them. You ask me how long a thousand years is, I'll tell you it's a thousand years. I won't tell you that, well, that in, in the ancient Greek world, that was a big number. That was a long expanse of time, but it was undefined. No, it wasn't. Have you ever bought a car? And when you ask the price, they said, well, it's $1,000. But to us, that's an indefinite amount of money. Would you buy the car? No. Oh! Be, be definite, right? Amen. All right. So anyway, Romans 7. What, what is he? And, and I want you to think about all the different possibilities that Jesus is referring to when he talks about the body. Number one. He was talking about his literal flesh and blood body. Remember in Hebrews, he says, uh, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. So the body of Christ's first coming was the body that he possessed, born of Mary, the virgin, flesh and blood body of Jesus Christ, that was also susceptible to pain, suffering, hunger, and death. It, that was a body that could have died. Same way ours is. So there's that interpretation. But he says he speaks of the temple of his body. And what other interpretation of the body of Jesus is there? Well, it's the church. So he says in Romans 7, verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So as the body of Christ literally was crucified on the cross, what does Paul say about that and its connection to us, the church? Did not the apostle Paul say, I am crucified? How? I am crucified with Christ, right? Y'all are looking at me like I just quoted the Book of Mormon. <laughs> I'm crucified with Christ, yet nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So as Jesus' body bore the shame and the suffering on the cross, should not we, as his body, also expect to bear the reproach and the shame of self-sacrifice? Not your best life now, but yielding over, giving things over. Somebody asked me this week about what it meant. The Bible talks about the sacrifices of praise. I will give the sacrifices of praise. And, and it, I had to think about that because I never really thought about what that meant. But here's what I think it means. When we, uh, when we give the sacrifices of praise, and I quoted this verse, I am crucified with Christ. Uh, the other verse, uh, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable of God. Jesus, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying to his father and he said, Father, if there's be any other way, let this cup pass from before me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So to follow Christ is to sacrifice our own will and what we want and what we think we can't live without is to sacrifice our ways and our way of doing things and learn to trust only in God doing it for us. I listened to some wacky, pink-haired Old lady who's trying to look like she's still 25, who calls herself a prophetess on the internet. Kat Kerr is her name. She's reprobate. And you know, she went on talking about how it's really the Christians of this world who have control over the weather. Because we release weather things on the earth, or we can speak and weather things are taken away from the earth. It's us who have control over these things. And I'm going, you're nuts, lady. Stupid. 
But anyway, to offer a sacrifice of praise means that you have yielded your will over completely to God so that when God does his perfect, wonderful, amazing, miracle work, you have no choice but to give God the thanks and the praise because he did it and you had nothing to do with it. Fact is, you stepped out of the way and said, God, you need to take over here. That, that was what I think the sacrifice of praise is. Um, so he said, you are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Make your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So as Christ's body was crucified, ours, we crucify our flesh daily. Tell our bodies you don't rule today. You're not running the show today. You're not in charge today. The spirit of Christ in me is going to be in charge today. That's what that means. Dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Romans 12 verse 4. The Bible says, for as we have many members in one body. So we have different people from different backgrounds here. We have different people from many different backgrounds on the internet. They're all different. The gentleman that called me today, even though we disagreed, we, I said, hey, brother, I love you. Had a good conversation with you. I'm glad it didn't turn into a knockdown drag out, which sometimes it does. Because pride kicks in on how we believe in things. Our pride kicks in and we are going to be right and... I have to work really hard on being meek. Conversations like that, not to be mean-spirited or anything like that. So, there, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Some people can get up in front of a group of people and prophesy, preach. And some people can't. Does that make the preachers more significant than those who do not preach? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Everybody has their unique place that God puts you in the body. And if you read Paul's deal on this in... in um, Romans 12, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 12 as well. You read Paul's dissertation on the members of the body. You'll see that sometimes the not so well known and not, not the prettiest parts of the body have a greater role in the body than the comely parts do. They have a greater function, greater responsibility. It's not just the preachers who are the most important thing in God's kingdom and in the body of Christ. It's everybody together that makes that. For we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one member is one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And he says on down, I've got this on the screen, verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. I had a pastor that came to me when I was preaching down south here a few weeks ago. And he said he's got a, he's got a big problem. He's got a guy that started coming to his church. He was there the night that I preached. And he said, this guy just, he said, he is a thorn in my flesh. He said, he contradicts all the time the Sunday school teacher while he's teaching Sunday school. He comes up with this. Well, now in the original Greek, what it really says there in that, in that passage is he's one of those guys. Or he'll say, now I have an NIV here. Now NIV says it completely different than that. And I kind of think that's the better. And he's constantly doing that. And what he's wanting to do, he's wanting, he's wanting to start 
his own Bible study with the people in that church. And he's told the pastor, I just feel like I have so much to offer. And there's some things here that I think the people really need that God has shown me. And I told that pastor, you need to run that guy out as quick as possible. First go to him, as the scripture says, to try to restore him. And if he won't, if he won't go along with it, you're the pastor. That church does not have two heads. I said, then take another witnesses. And he said, the people in the church, they, they spotted this guy. They know exactly what he is and what he's trying to do. He is trying to sow discord among those brethren there. We've had people like that here before. He's trying to sow discord among those people. He's trying to be someone of significance and draw away disciples unto himself. He doesn't care about those people. He cares about himself and he wants to be seen as being some hot shot among them. And I, I told the pastor, I said, I've had people like that. And I said, best thing to do, get them out as quick as you possibly can if they do not repent. Because he'll, he'll cause problems. So look what he says. Uh, we're, we're, oh, be, be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to, man, to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. He's telling us at, that we are the body and that's how we ought to act. 1 Corinthians 7, 4. The wife has not power of her own body, but the husband. Who's the husband? Christ. Who are we? The wife. And likewise, also the husband has not power of his own body, but the wife. They are one and the same together. Members of one body. So let's think about this for a minute. Back here in John 2, he said, destroy this temple three days. I will raise it up. But he spake of the temple of his body. First of all, yes, his literal physical body that died on the cross Three days later, the disciples remembered that he said this. He said, in three days, I'll raise it up. Sure enough, he did. He was speaking of the temple of his body. But then think of the church. All of us who were dead in trespasses and sins, has he not through salvation and Holy Spirit baptism brought us to brand new life again? And he's doing it in that three-day time period. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. It will culminate. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4. It will culminate in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. In other words, those who are dead in Christ. Would not have you ignorant concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In other words, in the rapture day, who gets to go first? The dead in Christ. And it's only fair. They died before you did. I died first. I get to be first in line. And um, for this you say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So that's also the body that he's referring to. The body of the church that in three days, we who were dead in trespasses and sins will be brought back to life again. Those who have already died and passed on no matter how many couple thousand years they've been laying in the grave, they've already turned to dust already. God's going to resurrect them. They're going to live with Jesus forever. 
in the three days that he was speaking of. 1 Corinthians 12. Don't, don't be desirous of somebody else's gift. Don't be jealous over someone who can do something in the body of Christ that you can't do. Likewise, never boast about what you can do in the body of Christ that other people can't do. Because that, after all, it was a gift. It was not something you earned. It was a present God gave you to do that. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, this is 1 Corinthians 12, 12, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. We literally are his body. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. John, how were you baptized? Down in the water? Up out of the water, right? Same way. It's one baptism. So is your baptism any more or less than my baptism? When I was a young man seeking God's will... A Baptist church was going to, was looking at me to be a youth minister. And I was seriously considering it. And I met with their deacon board and the pastor one night. And they discussed me with me in the room. And while I'm sitting there, one of the deacons said... Has he been baptized? And I said, yes, I have been by immersion in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Well, that's not what I'm asking. Were you baptized in our denominational churches? And I said, no. He said, well, would you be willing to be rebaptized?" And I had to give that some thought because I thought, well, I was baptized the exact same way you were with the exact same words you were baptized with. No difference whatsoever. So why is not my baptism accepted by this church? And when it came down to it, they were going to insist that if I was going to serve there, I had to be baptized in front of everybody in that church to please them. And I said, no. No. If my baptism wasn't good enough for you, then I'm not good enough for you. And I shouldn't be here. And God slammed that door shut hard. Okay? Um, so anyway... Baptized into one body, verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. And if the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? No. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? No. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? In other words, somebody in this church has to smell. But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And I've, I mean, I've seen people just jealous that some people could do things that they couldn't do. They wanted to do it so bad, like sing, sing a, you know, sing a special and they can't sing. You know, I feel bad for people like that, but they can't sing. 
It's not their gift. Concentrate on the things that God did give you. And do that with all your might, all your power. Because God placed you in that position. Do it as unto the Lord. Do the best you can. But God's not made all of us the same. But all of us are members of the one body of Jesus Christ. And there is only one body. Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 1. Is Christ divided? No. Can someone say, I'm only of Paul. I'm only of Apollos. Well, we're only of Christ. Is Christ divided? No. All of those who follow Paul or Paul or Apollos or Christ, they're still all members of the same body of Jesus Christ. And we have our resurrection date coming, I believe, soon. But not soon enough. Amen? Now, Exodus 20. Let's go back to this. Let's go, go back to John chapter 2. That's 8 o'clock. John chapter 2. I can't, I can't pass this up, but just go through this again because I love it. That number 46 that he mentioned here. In verse 19, Jesus answered, said, and they asked him the sign. What sign are you going to give us? Well, okay, I'll give you a sign. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now, let's stop here for a minute. And I will say this. Was that temple that Jesus was referring to, was it destroyed? Yes. In 70 AD, the uh, Caesar of Rome, I think it was Nero, sent troops to Jerusalem and burned it to the ground. I mean, burnt the temple, destroyed it, soldiers Stealing gold, knocking the stones down. Jesus said it in Matthew 24. They were showing the buildings of the temple. And he said, I declare unto you, not one stone will be left on another. And 70 AD, that thing happened. For the most part, it happened. Tore that temple completely down. Ruined any chance of the Jews being able to fulfill the requirements of the Old Testament law. God got rid of it. But, is there another temple that's going to be built? Yes. And I will tell you, in no uncertain terminology, the Jews won't be the ones who build it. Neither will the Gentiles. Neither will it be the Rockefellers. Neither will it be any other earthly organization, clandestine or otherwise. They will not build a temple for the Messiah to live in. He does not dwell in temples made with hands. And he won't this one. So there is going to be another temple in three days. Just exactly the way he's... See, multiple applications. The temple of his literal body, flesh and blood. The temple of the church. And the temple in Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. And I promise you, mankind has never seen a building the way Jesus is going to build this building. It's never been seen before. Okay? So maybe I'll talk to you about that next week and get in trouble again. So I'd people chewing me out over that. Yeah! Wow! When that's, it's, I mean, it's clearly that's what the Bible's saying. I mean, clearly that's what the Bible's saying. And I can't wait to see that. To be part of it, amen. But he said, uh, so we have multiple applications here. The temple of his physical body, the temple of the church, and then the temple of the last days that Christ is going to dwell in as he reigns a thousand years over this earth. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. 
Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and without rear it up in three days. And what I'll show you next Wednesday night is that every temple that the Israelites had, that number was in it. Okay? And you have to ask the question, how did they know what that number was? How did they know to do that? They didn't have Francis Crick and I can't remember the Watson guy's first name. They didn't have them in Moses' day defining for them the DNA molecule and what it looked like and how many DNA chromosomes we had in each one of our cells. They didn't know that in Moses' day. So how did Moses build his tabernacle exactly that way? How did Solomon do it? How did these Jews do it? After the dispersion, when they came back from Babylonian captivity, they set the building of the temple again, and it took them 46 years to build it. But how did they know what that number meant? They didn't. But I assure you, God did. I assure you he did. Amen.